everyone. At least it's morning here in Marietta, Ohio, where I'm coming from. My name is Mary Jeanette Ebenhack, and um, we expected to have a moderator uh, for this session, but uh, something might have happened, so I'm just going to take this away myself. Um, I'll be introducing myself uh, as we go along here, so um, it's not really needed for a moderator at all. So. I want to thank you for uh, joining this course on uh, having fun learning English grammar. And um, my guess is that we have people uh, on this um, uh, Zoom call from all over the world. So let me just not only say hello to you, but also bonjour, uh, hola, assalamu alaikum, uh, konnichiwa. Ni hao and ciao. And if I've missed your language, hopefully uh, you'll let me know and I can greet you uh, in your own language next time. So let me just tell you a little bit about myself. Given the high quality of uh, the Pio Petro uh, lectures, you probably assumed that you were going to be getting a lecture from an uh, esteemed English professor at some large university. Well, unfortunately, that is not true. So perhaps you thought, well, maybe you'd be getting this lecture from a uh, uh, ESL teacher with years of experience. Well, again, that's not true. Well, at least you would have thought that, you know, you'd be getting this lecture from somebody who's taught English somewhere. Uh, again, uh, that is not true. So who am I? Well, I'm a lifelong speaker of English and my mom was an English teacher. So I've been speaking English for over 60 years and doing a lot of writing of English. So those are my qualifications for teaching this class. So if you have any uh, qualms about being in this class, Let's put those to rest because we're all going to do some learning here. So why am I teaching this class given that I'm not a teacher of English? Well, perhaps you thought I'm getting great pay to do it. Mm, unfortunately, no, I'm, I'm not getting paid at all. So maybe you think, well, maybe there's some great career advancement for me doing this. Mm, no. I'm retired, so my career is over. So maybe you think, hmm, maybe I owed something to the Pio Petro organizer and I'm paying off a debt. Hmm, no, actually, the Pio Petro organizer owes me. So why am I doing this? Well, you might say I've been duped. What does it mean to be duped? That might be a new word for some people. Well, dupe is a verb meaning to deceive, to delude, to trick, or to fool. Well, why do I say that I've been duped? Well, watch out for Ahmed Algarhi, the Pio Petro organizer. I thought I was going to be doing a one hour lecture like my husband did. No, turns out it's four one hour lectures. I thought it would be on a topic of my choice, something that I really have expertise in. Mm, nope, I was assigned the topic of English grammar. So really, why am I doing this? Well, to tell you the truth, I found myself looking for a new creative outlet. I had a little time on my hands. And I was up for a challenge. I've made some other things, you know, um, I've taken on other responsibilities that I didn't know much about and did them. Or you might just say, I'm plain stupid. It's a possibility. So I'm going to begin this uh, class then with a poll. And the question is, who duped you into taking this class? Was it a parent, a sibling? a professor or academic advisor, a colleague, 
a friend, an ex-friend, or no one. I really wanted to learn English grammar, or I don't understand the question. So I haven't done polls before, but I understand all I have to do is go to poll number one and launch it. So I'll take just a few minutes for you again to tell me who encouraged you or who duped you into taking this class. Was it a parent, a sibling? A sibling is brother and sister. A professor or academic advisor, a colleague, a friend, a person who's a friend who's no longer a friend, or was it yourself? You really want to learn English grammar. Okay, so looks like we're 100%. So what's the, oh, so some of you were encouraged by your parents, some were encouraged by a friend. Um, Ahmed, you want to help me interpret this poll? Um, okay, so you can, you can stop sharing with what is the last, what is the green button at the bottom here. Okay. You can uh, share results. Oh, okay. Okay, then if you want to, after you discuss it, yes, you can keep the result. Ah, so we've got people who actually do want to learn English grammar, but some people were uh, encouraged by parents and friends. Okay, thanks. Good to know you're out there and you're actually um, um, responding to the poll. So I wanna talk a little bit about the goals for this class. Perhaps you would think with this class, you'll end up being in full command of the English language. Uh, that is not going to happen. Perhaps you'll think that at least some of you will be able to write English flawlessly. That is not going to happen either. Perhaps a few of you will be able to speak English fluently by the end of this class. Nope, that's not going to happen either. What's going to happen is hopefully all of us will have some fun as we tune our ears to the mind boggling language that we know as English. So this is not a comprehensive class, but hopefully it will get you a little further down the road to speaking and writing English. So let me launch poll number two then. And Ahmed, I need a little help. Oh, here we go. Polls. Poll number two. Okay. <clears throat> I'd like to know a little bit about who's in this class. Are you a working professional? Uh, are you a graduate school student? A university student? A high school student? A primary school student? Something other than some of this than what I've listed here, or you can also ask, answer. I don't understand the question. So it looks like our um, poll is done, and we do have twenty five percent working professionals, thirty eight percent graduate school students, us uh, uh, thirteen percent college students, and twenty five percent high school students. Well, welcome. I am glad that you are all here. So um, next poll, I'd like for you to tell me where you are today. What city are you in? What country are you in? And what is your first language? Now to do this, you need to open the chat. So just put city, country, and what is your native language or your first language? So, Ahmed? Uh, you can click the chat, do the same thing. Right, Just and the, uh, the host, do, do I need chat. to make something visible? Because I'm not seeing any responses so far. Whenever you write something, it will show. 
Okay. I'm not seeing anything come through yet. I'll give you just a few more seconds. So what city are you tuning in from today? Where is that city located and what country? And what's your first native language? Ah, here's somebody from uh, Algeria. Speak the first language uh, is Arabic. We have someone from Nigeria. Uh, Hausa is his native language. Another person from Algeria. So I'll have to learn how to say hello in Hausa. Okay, uh, someone from Chad whose first language is French. Great, very good. Let's give 30 more seconds. Oh, someone from Ecuador, first language is Spanish. Muy bien. And Beijing uh, from Ecuador again. Spanish, wonderful. Uh, Beijing, China, whose first language is French. That's very interesting. Okay. And someone from South Sudan, living in Cairo, whose language is Arabic. Wonderful. Assalamu alaikum. All right. I'm going to end this now and move on. Okay. Uh, this is the last poll for a while, but I would like to know how well you speak English, how good is your English? So I'm gonna launch this fourth poll here. And please tell me then, is English your first language? Perhaps you're just taking this course as a refresher or easy certificate. Uh, perhaps you're bilingual, English being your second language. Uh, thirdly, um, Perhaps you use English regularly, but you're more comfortable in your own language. Or uh, perhaps you've studied English for more than five years. Have you studied English for more than one year? Or I don't understand the question. Okay, the answers are coming in. Great, I really appreciate you being so responsive here. Okay. Five more seconds and we'll end this poll. Okay, so um, the results are that we've got 23% of people who consider themselves fully bilingual, English being their second language, 31% uh, that use English regularly but are more comfortable in their own language, 31% uh, that have studied English for more than five years, and 15% that have studied English for more than a year. Wonderful. Well, especially for those of you who are only beginners in English, um, welcome. And um, we'll try to not go over your head, but hang in there if you, um, you know, are feeling a little overwhelmed. Okay. I wanted to say up front that this class is not for everyone. It is for people who are good humored, the playful, the fun loving, and the young at heart. Thus, we're calling it having fun learning English grammar. It is not for people who are humorless or workaholics, the serious, or we might say the old in spirit. That class, if you're interested in um, being really serious about learning English, check in with Ahmed Algarhi for the class, Getting Serious, Learning English, um, the English language. Okay, um, moving along. One of my favorite movies is called Mary Poppins. If you haven't seen it, I really recommend it. It's a great Walt Disney film that came out in 1964. Here's a picture of Julie Andrews, the star of the show. And at one point in this show, she says, or she sings to her two um, 
children that she's the nanny for. In every job that must be done, there is an element of fun. You find the fun and snap. The job's a game. And every task you undertake becomes a piece of cake, a lark, a spree. It's very clear to see that a spoonful of sugar helps the medicine go down. Medicine go down in a most delightful way. I didn't read that quite correctly because my camera is in front of my screen. But anyway, the whole point of uh, giving you the words to that song is we hope to find the, I hope to find the element of fun in learning English. So that's my goal is to help you learn English and have a little fun doing it. Um, another musical that I want to recommend to you is one called My Fair Lady. And uh, I'm talking, uh, going to talk about this in terms of the challenges of learning English, because this whole musical is a story about trying to teach a uh, lower class person in England how to speak English properly. And they find, or just to say up front, English is hard to learn. So I'm going to give you the uh, words to another song that comes from this musical. It says, why can't the English teach their children how to speak? Norwegians learn Norwegian. The Greeks are taught their Greek. Arabians learn Arabic with the speed of summer lightning. The Hebrews learn it backwards, which is absolutely frightening but use proper English and you're regarded as a freak. Why can't the English learn to speak? Well, there are a few reasons why English is a difficult language to learn. So let's just be honest about that up front. One of the reasons is that English is a hodgepodge of other languages. So it's, as this slide says, 26% of English vocabulary uh, is Germanic. That is very closely related to the German language. Nearly 30% is French and 30% is Latin in origin. And then added to that, there are a lot of other languages that get, um, that we have words in English from other languages. So for instance, uh, we have Arabic words in English. Some of those are coffee, sugar, algebra. They're very common uh, English words that come from other countries. I had a, I think magazine or so, is another one of the words that comes from Arabic. So. Um, other reasons that English is difficult is there are a lot of dialects in English. Not only is English spoken differently in the United States than it is in England or Canada or Australia or other English speaking countries, but even within my own country, which is the United States, there are pronounced dialects. People living in the southern part of the United States, we say speak with a southern drawl. And people, people who live in the northeastern part of the United States, we say have a northeastern dialect. And uh, African-American people in the United States also have a peculiar way of speaking English sometimes. Also, there are some very confusing things about English. Some of our words are just um, nonsensical. Um, for instance, what does pineapple have to do with the words pine and apple? Absolutely nothing. So um, there are a lot of idioms in, um, in English that uh, we'll talk about a little later. The grammar and uh, spelling 
uh, in English are very difficult because, uh, first of all, there's a lot of rules, but then there's exceptions to almost every rule. And to make matters worse, there are new words being added to English every year. I heard recently on a news telecast that there's over 200 words just this year being added to an English dictionary. So English is being spoken differently than it was uh, 500 years ago or even 200 years ago. Uh, there's a brand new word that's uh, being used quite a lot called woke. You know, that wasn't a part of English even two years ago. And now everybody's using it. It has nothing to do with being awake. But um, anyway, just an example of new words being added all the time. So here's another challenge, and I've already alluded to it. And that is, you can't learn English in four grammar sessions. Um, so again, uh, set your sights on what is practical. We're going to hopefully learn a little more English in these four sessions, but it's not gonna be comprehensive by any means. Another challenge is that this isn't the best age for you to learn a language. So, so we have some people as young as high school age, but we didn't have any primary, I don't think, could be wrong about that. Uh, but the best age for learning a language is actually from the age of zero to six. Here's a little chart that shows the aptitude for learning language and the years. So you can see that our ability to learn a language really decreases after six years of age. So, uh, you know, cut yourself a, a little bit of a break. Uh, you're learning a new language at um, not the most optimum time. Also, another challenge is that Zoom is not the best platform by a long shot for learning a language. Let's look at this uh, learning pyramid over here on the right of your screen. The best way to learn another language is teach that language to others. And I really want to vouch for that because in the time that I've been um, working on these presentations for this course, I have learned a heck of a lot about my own language. So um, the next best is you know, to practice it regularly with someone. Uh, another would be to have a group discussion about it. Um, then the passive teaching methods would be demonstration, audiovisual, at least we have a little audiovisual here, uh, reading, lecture. And I assume they're thinking that lecture is where I can see my students and my, the students can see the professor, but we don't even have that. So I can't see you. I don't know what your reaction is. You can't ask me questions. So we're really at a disadvantage for learning English here. Nevertheless, we are going to muddle through. But I do want to say that, or say again, the best way to learn a language is to teach it to someone else. So on the screen here, I'm giving you um, photos of a few books published by um, Millbrook um, Publishing and written by Brian P. Cleary. Uh, I'm going to be relying on these books heavily in this class. I think they're wonderful books. I'm a fan of uh, Dr. Seuss. Hopefully you have read a few Dr. Seuss books in your time. They're clever. They're rhyming. They're uh, insightful. So um, I'm going to be sending you on email a list of Brian Cleary, P. Cleary books on grammar, all of them are available on YouTube. And so I highly invite you to find a young person and read these books to them. It's a great way to learn English grammar. 
So here's a little bit of good news. And that is that you don't need to understand grammar to speak English. There have been people for centuries who've been speaking English and have never had a class on grammar and wouldn't know a noun from a verb from an adverb. So it doesn't uh, take a grammar class for you to start learning English, but it may help you speak it better and keep you from looking like an idiot. So irony is being defined here by someone is when someone writes, you're an idiot. Now, irony means saying the opposite of what is really true. So I'm going to do another poll here and see if you can tell me, and this is not a test, this is just a poll. Why does the sentence, you're an, an idiot, indicate that the writer rather than the person being addressed is the true idiot. And just in case you don't know the word idiot, idiot means a fool, a half-wit, an imbecile, a dolt, a dunce, or a numbskull. So I think this is poll number five. Let me see if I can bring it up. I think um, this poll um, this is just a little different from what's on the screen. So, you know, take a guess. Nobody's holding you that you're not, this is not a test. Okay. Okay. So I'm gonna end the poll here. Okay, so uh, a few of you thought that idiot is spelled wrong. Mm, nope, that's not the reason. Uh, a few of you think that and should be a or and. Uh, nope, that's not correct either. Uh, your and your sound the same, but they are different parts of speech. That's the correct answer. And we're going to look at the difference between your, Y-O-U-R, and your, Y-O-U apostrophe, R-E, a little later in this class. And by the end of this class, you'll know what's the difference between your and your. And then thank you for being honest, those of you who have no idea. Okay. So let's start at the very beginning. In Mary Poppins, I think it says, it's a very good place to start. So I want to tell you a little story. There once was a salesman who could not speak Arabic and he was finding it very difficult to market his newly invented fire extinguisher in Arabia. He consulted an expert who advised him to use photographs. So he proceeded to put together flyers and billboards showing a car on fire fighting the fire with the fire extinguisher, and then a restored car. So this is what he was going for. So what happened is he put these billboards up all over Arabia, but Arabic is read from right to left. So they saw a car, the fire extinguisher, and a burning car. So they avoided the, the fire extinguisher totally. So the point of this little story is English is read from left to right, not right to left. Alrighty. Let's begin our grammar lessons with looking at nouns. Nouns are words that name a living being, a person, an animal, an insect, a place, a thing, or an idea or concept. So I'm going to um, use Brian Cleary's book called A Mink, a Fink, and a Skating Rink, What is a Noun? And he says, if it's a 
person, place, or thing, your dad, Detroit, a diamond ring, if it's a boat or coat or clown, it's simple, Simon, it's a noun. So let's look first at um, words that name a thing, nouns that are things. A box, a lip, a chocolate chip, a cup or glass from which you sip, a pocket, button, sleeve or cuff, a noun can simply be your stuff. Got to move by. Nouns are words like girls and curls, cats and flats and hats and pearls, a crumb, some gum, a tiny rocket. A noun can be what's in your pocket. So here's your assignment. Make a list of what's in your pockets right now. These will be things, these will be nouns. So I'm going to give you 30 seconds now to check your pockets, take out a piece of paper, write down what's in your pockets. And Ahmed, I need you to do this. We're going to use the nouns, the, the things that are in your pockets for an assignment a little later on. So, if you don't have any pockets on, see what's on your desk. Write down what's on your desk or in your purse. Just whatever's around you, what's, what are these things? All of these will be nouns. Okay, hopefully you've got four or five things written down right now. I'm going to read another poem to you as you're kind of finishing that up. This is another poem by Brian P. Brian P. Cleary. A photo of my doggy Dave and one of Richard Nixon. A cell phone from eight years ago that needs a little fixing. Half a double cheeseburger, half a pint of soup. A soggy old toupee I found that smells a bit like poop. A deck of cards, 11 cents, a salamander dice. Seashells, a harmonica, that's old, but pretty nice. Duct tape, scotch tape, French tape, and a yo-yo, minus string. What's inside my pockets? Well, you might say everything. And just for your edification, here's what cargo shorts look like. Okay, let's go on to words that name a living being. A noun can be your Auntie Lynn, the mayor of the town you're in, your friend who tells you corny jokes. A noun can be your favorite folks. So, another assignment on that same piece of paper that you're using. Please write down for me five of your favorite people or animals or maybe even insects, if you have a favorite insect. Give you just uh, 30 more seconds to do that. Your favorite folks, people or animals. Document, you doing this? Yes. Great. Let's go on. Words that name a place. If it's a place of any kind, a mountain, hall, or highway nine, if it's a country, state, or town, then surely, surely, it's a noun. Well, wouldn't you know, another assignment. Please write down three places that you would like to visit someday, and also three places you have been today. And I'm thinking like your kitchen, bathroom, hallway, sidewalk, store, whatever, wherever you might have been today. So write down three places you would like to visit and three places you have been today. Okay, so 
As you know, I've been asking Ahmed, who is pitch hitting for our moderator today, to write down his uh, words. So here we go. This is called a mad lib. So we're going to use the nouns that Ahmed write down, wrote down to fill in this story. I will send this uh, to you on email, and so you can fill in your own words. So my unusual pet, the story using nouns. I have a very unusual pet. Well, it is really not a pet at all. It is actually a what, Ahmed? Wallet. A wallet. It keeps an eye on me, and sometimes we share a pizza or go to, what's a place you wrote down, Ahmed? Yeah, Greece. Greece. It loves to play tricks, like the time it talked to me into fill, into fill, it talked me into filling my sister's, what is a thing? Uh, iPhone. iPhone with 36, another thing. I did not get that. No, let's say pins. Boy, was she angry. She immediately told a person. Dad, dad. Okay, my dad. Okay. Once I took my pet, that is his wallet, to the movies and it spilled popcorn all over a thing or a person. Keys. Okay, over keys. And of course, I got blamed for it. You might not think you would have to feed it, but every morning I give it another thing. Uh, milk. Milk. And every afternoon, it likes what for a snack? Um, cookies. cookies for a snack. When it comes to people, I like spending time with a person. Uh, daughter. My daughter. But when it comes to pets, there's nothing like a wallet to make life interesting. Okay. I hope you'll have some fun with Mad Libs. Um, just a fun little thing. All right, so um, besides just regular nouns, I want to talk about proper nouns. And here we go with more info from Brian P. Cleary. Nouns can sometimes be quite proper, like Brooklyn Bridge and Edward Hopper, London, Levi's, Pekingese. Proper nouns name all of these. Proper nouns all name specific people, things, and places. Like Uncle Lou or Timbuktu, they start with upper cases. Like Mallory or Valerie, the Seventh Street Gallery, Pizza, Pete's, and Ming's Chinese, proper nouns name each of these. Or Brannigan and Flanagan parading in with Anagan, Paris, France, and your dog chopper, all these nouns are mighty proper. Well, I hope you've noticed that um, all these proper nouns are capitalized. Proper nouns are always capitalized. That's one way to identify them. So proper nouns can be things. Uh, so um, here's another little assignment for you. I'd like for um, you to write down three specific people using proper nouns, write down three specific places using proper nouns, and three specific things. And the reason that I, um, uh, over on the left side of the screen, listed some uh, things that are proper nouns is I kind of had a hard time thinking about things that would be proper nouns. So. Uh, proper nouns could be brand names or companies, Cheerios, Kleenex, Pepsi, Coke, Oreo, Google, Mercedes. Those would all be um, proper nouns that are things. I think in terms of people, you're not going to have a hard time with that. Um, and even places, you know, cities, countries, um, mountain ranges, whatever. Uh, I think you'll uh, find that easy to do. I found at least that coming up with things that are proper nouns was a little more challenging. Okay, 
I'll stop talking and let you jot down those, including Mr. Algarhi, Dr. Algarhi, excuse me. All right. Let's move on then to abstract nouns. What are abstract nouns? Brian P. Cleary says, there are nouns you cannot touch or smell or hear or see. This type is called an abstract noun, like joy and harmony. Love and hate are abstract nouns, and so are peace and love. You cannot taste or hold them like a tart or telescope. Peace and hope, I guess I read that wrong. One more time. Love and hate are abstract nouns, and so are peace and hope. You cannot taste or hold them like a tart or telescope. Okay, so let's try to figure out um, the abstract nouns in a sentence that I read for you before from that um, song in Mary Poppins. It says, in every job that must be done, there is an element of fun. So what are the abstract nouns in this sentence? All of them, you know, are no, not things you can hold in your hand or take a picture of, but they're nouns nevertheless. In every job that must be done, there is an element of fun. So, Dr. Algarhi, what are the abstract nouns in this sentence? Can you repeat the sentence again? In every job that must be done, there is an element of fun. Fun. Fun is an abstract noun. There's two more. We'll leave the two more for the audience. Okay. Uh, job is an abstract noun. Yes. Job. And element is an abstract noun. So three abstract nouns in that sentence. So here's just a slide showing a lot of other abstract nouns. Justice, it's a kind of a concept. Uh, anger, success, uh, deceit, knowledge. These are all words that are abstract nouns. So um, I might send you a whole list of abstract nouns, but um, I think you'll catch on pretty soon. You know, honesty, courage, um, these are all abstract nouns. So uh, here's a little quiz that uh, we were going to do, and um, this will be sent to you. You want to explain how we're doing the quizzes, Dr. Algarhi? Yes, uh, you mean the homework quiz, right? Or the quiz you will do to you right now. Yeah. Just go to uh, polls and do the same the same way like you did the polls before. You will find the quiz part one. Okay. Great. Okay. All right. So um, let's go ahead and uh, let's just do this quiz online. Um, this is not going to be graded. There'll be quizzes later, which will be graded, but this one is not going to be graded. So which of these words are now are nouns? Canada, swimmer, watermelon, donkey, or noisy? I'll just remind you, there is more than one correct answer to these questions. So the answer is that Canada, yes, is a noun. It's a place. A swimmer is a noun. Yes, it's a person. Watermelon is a noun. It's a thing. Donkey is a noun. It's an animal, and that's a noun. Noisy, no. That is not a noun. That is what we're going to later learn is an adjective. Hmm. Okay, technical difficulties here. Okay, um, 
I'm not sure we have these others on our um, poll. Is this? You want to show the second part? Yes. Okay, go to polls. Uh, there's uh, quiz part two. No, that's not what I'm doing here, but okay. Let's just do this um, uh, for fun here. So which of these proper nouns are written correctly? A, Mr. Smith with a capital M and a capital S. Marietta College with a capital M, but not a capital C. President Washington, not with a capital P, but with a capital W. New York, capital N, capital Y, or United Arab Emirates with a capital A. Well, I think you'll probably get these pretty easily. What are written correctly is Mr. Smith, Mr. is capitalized and Smith is capitalized, and New York, both New and York is capitalized. The others are all proper nouns, but they're missing some capitalization. College should be capitalized, president should be capitalized, and United and Emirates should be capitalized. Third question out of four, which of these words are abstract nouns? Remember, you can't touch or smell or um, uh, see them with anything but your mind. Okay, adventure, worry, beauty, education, and childhood. Well, if you said these are all abstract nouns, you would be correct. And finally, what is not a noun? A place, slow, a person, a thing, an animal, or an idea? Well, if you said slow, you're right. Again, that's an adjective. So I'm pretty sure you got those pretty well. I'm going to uh, move on now to talking about how you make a noun plural. And this is where we get into some pretty interesting things. I wanna just check our time. So we have nine minutes left. Uh, I was hoping to do a couple more things beyond that, but we're going to just wrap up with plural nouns today. So, plural means more than one. So, two, three, four, whatever. More than one living being, more than one place, more than one thing, more than one concept or idea. So now we're into a new book by Brian Cleary called Feet and Puppies, Thieves and Guppies. What are irregular plurals? So cats and hats and acrobats, hamsters, squares, and squirrels. Because they all name more than one, these words are known as plurals. So let's do just a little uh, exercise here. What is the plural of circle? How about tree? Trees. How about elephant? Elephants. Notebook. Notebooks. Computer. Computers. So all you do to make these nouns plural is just add an S. Hooray! Simple. Now a little complicated. Plural means there's more, there's two or more of something, for instance, dresses, bosses, boxes, furry foxes. See how they all end in ESs? So some nouns you simply add an S to the end, but some nouns you add ES. And that is if the word ends in an S, an X a Z, a CH, or an SH. So let's just go over a few of these again. So what is the plural of dish? It ends in SH. So it would add ES, dishes. 
How about guess? And an S. So guesses. How about class? Classes. Kiss. Kisses. Lunch. C-H. Lunches. Arch. Arches. I think you've got it, right? Okay. Now, let's take a look at a few nouns that end in O. Again, you add ES to these to make them plural. Brian Cleary says some words, when they end in O, need ES when they're plural, as in I see potatoes and tomatoes on that mural. So all over on the right-hand side, you see some other um, words that end in O that you add ES to make them plural, okay? And now here's where English gets complicated. There are some words in English that end with O that you don't add ES, you just add S. So again, here's a whole list. I'm not gonna read them all, but um, there is no real rhyme or reason for this. It's just simply you have to learn which words end in ES and which end in S. Sorry about that, but that's English. Nouns that end in Y. Many words that end in Y will change to IES when naming more than one, as in my buddies made a mess. The singular is buddy and the plural form is buddies. This rule applies to lots of words like candies, babies, studies. Guppies, puppies, parties, pennies, jellies, bellies, berries. Mommies, daddies, flies, and patties. Bonies, skies, and cherries. Okay. So. Let's look at some of these nouns that end in Y. Bunny turns to bunnies. Enemy, enemies. Lady, ladies. Daisy, daisies. City, cities. And activity, activities. But wouldn't you know it, there are some words that end in Y that do not take I-E-S, they simply take S. And this is a nice little graphic for telling you that there is a, um, I wouldn't call it rule, but it is somewhat logical, which you add S to and which you add I-E-S. So when a word ends with a consonant, and a consonant would be uh, B, C, D, E, not E, a, B, C, um, B. Uh, you change the Y to I and add ES. But when a word ends with a vowel, A, E, I, O, U, uh, keep the Y and add S. So over here we have days, it ends, um, or it, preceding the Y is an A. Ways, again, A. Trays. Keys, again, is a vowel. Holidays, a noise, uh, a vowel again, right before the Y. And monkeys is another example. Um, again, a vowel right before the Y. So a little bit of uh, a logical reason for why some are IES and some are just simply S. Okay, let's look at some nouns that end in F or F-E. If an F-E ends your word, then swap it for a V. In plural forms, take wives and knives and wives to name just three. Often when F ends the word, the plural makes this change. The F turns to V-E-S as in these loaves 
are strange. Again, let's take a look at how we plural some words that end in F or F-E. Calf becomes calves. Leaf becomes leaves. Shelf becomes shelves. And thief becomes thieves. But one more, scarf becomes scarves. And just because it's English, there are some words that end in F and F-E that do not follow this rule. So cliff becomes cliffs, chief, chiefs, roof, roofs, belief, beliefs, chef, chefs. Again, I don't know that there's any uh, logical reason for why some uh, words ending in F or F-E uh, change to V-E-S and others just add an S. It's one of those things, again, that um, you just have to memorize these words. And I think we are just about out of time. So I need to skip ahead, Ahmed, to our final poll. So uh, let me see, I think poll number six. I'd like for you to give me a little feedback on this first class. This is the first of four, by the way. It's uh, next Friday. We'll be the same, this, this Friday, the same time. Uh, we'll be meeting again for session two, and then we'll meet again on Monday and next Wednesday. So how was this class for you? Uh, you have a, a choice of great, I understood everything and it all made sense. Uh, okay, I understood a lot, but some things were confusing. Not so good, I did not understand very much. Bad, I felt I understood very little, and uh, I don't even understand the question. So take a couple minutes, let me know, how was this class for you today? Five more seconds, I'm gonna end the poll. Alrighty, so um, hooray, a lot of you said it was great, you understood and it made sense. Woo! 77%, 15% um, uh, said you understood quite a bit, but some things were confusing. I'm not surprised. English is confusing. And some not so good. You didn't understand very much. Well, hang in there. Again, what we're trying to do here is just kind of get the English cadence and rhythm into your mind so that like a young child, you will just kind of absorb it rather than have to really study it. So if it's not making sense, all you have to do is, you know, just kind of listen to how it rolls off my tongue and become accustomed to how English sounds. So please hang in there if uh, you had difficulty this time. And uh, uh, we'll hope that you can absorb some of the, some of the sounds of English. All right. Um, as I said, I'm going to be sending you uh, a few things. Uh, the list of Brian P. Cleary books, the Mad Lib that we did, and uh, maybe one or two other things. Um, I have, um, as I said, really learned a lot from this course. I hope that you'll learn a lot. And I hope that you had a little bit of fun as we uh, uh, embarked on this endeavor. So. Thank you very much for being here. Uh, Ahmed, anything we need to do to close before? Yes, just I want to remind you to uh, register in the Google Classroom because uh, without registering in Google Classroom, you cannot do your quizzes, you cannot do your final, you cannot get your certificate at the end. So please, the most important thing is to uh, register in Google Classroom.
And for sure, you will find links for how to uh, register. You will find this at uh, Arab Oil and Gas Academy at Facebook, at uh, uh, Arab Pro at Facebook, at Madrasti at Facebook. Also, you will receive it by email if you register, if you fill the registration form. Thank you very much. Okay, see you on Friday.